All right, uh, we are going to be discussing another chapter in uh, this book, uh, in the beginning. Uh, we've been going through them in a uh, regular fashion. The book is here, it's information on the screen about it. Uh, and you've been informed of this question quite a number of times before. So let's just uh, go to uh, what we're doing specifically today. Uh, we have here uh, the last chapters of the book. We've gone through uh, the, uh, well, we went through uh, <coughs> John Walton number 13 last week. Uh, Paul could not be here today. And since I had written chapter 15, uh, he asked me to present it today. So we skip one chapter now, uh, number 14, uh, but uh, he'll be uh, covering that later on. So, so we're going to cover chapter number 15. Uh, there's a, uh, a little problem here when they asked me to do this. Uh, there's a book, Understanding Creation, that we went through. I mean, it's uh, <coughs> put out by Pacific Press. And then they asked me, well, can you write a chapter on the very same topic? And that is evidence of the flood uh, for this book. And I, I wrote to the editor and I told him I'd be glad to do it. Uh, I've done this so many times. I wrote the Adventist commentary on this and so on. And uh, it's one of the topics they tend to ask me to do. Uh, and I told him, but uh, I just wrote a chapter on this for Pacific Press. You're publishing this book in Pacific Press. Uh, they don't want the same thing, I'm sure. He said, oh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, you can do it. Now, there is a difference between these two chapters. I, we discussed the early chapter I wrote before with you uh, quite a while back. <coughs> and uh, this is exactly the same topic, the very same question. Uh, so uh, they point out to me, well, this is a more comprehensive coverage. And it is a wonderful thing. Because when I had to write that first chapter, chapter for the first book, I was limited to 2,400 words. Uh, this one, 8,000. And uh, it was such a breath of fresh air uh, to be able to explain what you're talking about. And so uh, uh, this is a repeat. Now, I purposely will not go over the details that I went over last time with you. We will cover them. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, gone through uh, that previous lecture and so on, so you'll understand what the chapter is all about, because that's what the discussion is all about. But I, I'm going to go off into several detailed tangents to avoid uh, too much repetition and to get into some of the stuff that really gets interesting uh, when you look into this. Uh, question of uh, the Genesis flood, the geological evidence for the Genesis flood, and what is uh, involved in that. And if you want more details, uh, you can go to my uh, web page there, and uh, it goes on forever there. Anyway, uh, <coughs> this is chapter 11, that other book. I much more recommend this one simply because, you know, it's, it's uh, 8,000 words. And you have a chance to explain things a little bit. But uh, here's the chapter in this book here, in the beginning. Uh, <coughs> so on. The Genesis Flood and the Geological Record. Now, this is a controversial issue, very controversial issue. Uh, We've talked a lot about in this class and earlier in this book about, you know, how uh, God is, is at issue here between uh, secularism and the Bible. Uh, God is uh, fairly well authenticated in many ways. 
uh, in the Bible by uh, scientific data, not directly, but certainly uh, authenticated. Uh, but here we get into an issue that uh, is within the Christian community, very much so within the Christian community. And that is, is the account of beginnings true in the Bible? A lot of Christians uh, interpret the first 11 chapters of Genesis as being allegorical. Uh, it's uh, mythology, so on. The real history begins with chapter 12 in Genesis. And of course, uh, 1 to 11 takes in uh, creation by God, takes in the flood, uh, and so on. And that is considered not exactly uh, authentic, not exactly correct. Uh, sure, we believe in God, we believe in the rest of the Bible, uh, but not that account of beginnings. And so it, and the issue is it's striking, because the two accounts could hardly be different in terms of the scientific account and the, uh, the biblical account. And uh, those who don't, uh, Christians who don't believe the biblical account tend to uh, follow the uh, scientific model. It's billions of years. Life has been here on Earth for billions of years. It's been evolving for billions of years. Uh, and here we are as a result of uh, uh, progressive evolution and so on. So uh, <coughs> uh, when you contrast that with the Bible talking about, hey, uh, just a few thousand years ago, uh, somewhere uh, 6,000 in, in uh, some interpretations, a little more than that in others, and so on. But uh, that, that accounts widely dismissed as unscientific. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, issue is uh, a sensitive one because it tends to affect how seriously you take the Bible. And so uh, people get uh, you know, sometimes excited about these issues. And it's, uh, but uh, keep in mind, we're dealing here with past events. Not all information is always compelling. Uh, the past we cannot always repeat in experiments, and uh, uh, certainly you can't in terms of creation and the, and the flood and so on. So that uh, we don't have as rigorous data as we want, but uh, the question we're addressing here, is it reasonable to believe in the biblical account in spite of the stance of the scientific community that has excluded God in its interpretations? Uh, essentially, an atheistic uh, philosophy, although they don't like to be uh, called that, uh, I was traveling in Switzerland a while back and uh, took a picture of some cows all lined down. Hey, we're such conformists. Uh, this is a good example of it. And so I, I took my picture to illustrate. We tend to, you know, feel the comfort in being in agreement with other people. Uh, just a minute later, I took this picture, and one of the cows had risen up, and I thought, hey, uh, there's a good example. Uh, the Adventist Church uh, stands up a little bit different from others. Uh, we are people of the book. We believe the Bible. We believe the whole Bible. And uh, we're one of the leading denominations, in fact, uh, probably most seriously concerned about the Bible. And our Seventh-day Sabbath kind of dictates this because our Seventh-day Sabbath is based on the Sixth-day creation. We're here today on Saturday. Uh, because of this uh, belief and so on, authenticating our confidence in the Bible and in this creation account. So we uh, can take heart, you know, 
conformism is a strong, a strong pressure, but uh, there are at times uh, cows and other and the rest of us willing to, you know, uh, break away from the uh, from the uh, traditional thing. Uh, you go out in these rock layers out there, and you know sometimes uh, you got to keep in mind that this, this tradition uh, carries a lot of weight. Uh, this is in Utah. Uh, see the pinkish layers up there. Uh, and ask a park ranger about them, he'll tell you, oh, that's uh, 50 million years old. And then uh, in front of it, you got some, some other uh, tree covered slopes there. Uh, and you ask him, say, yeah, that's about 60 million years. And yeah, okay, you know. And then, uh, Everybody seems to say, okay, uh, it's, and you, you come there back there five years later and nothing has changed. And uh, 10 years later, nothing has changed. And you say, hey, nothing changes. Well, yeah, uh, things, things don't change. And so it's easy to get into that mode and need to keep this in mind uh, when we're dealing with uh, People of different opinion that keep it, do keep in mind. Hey, uh, could there have been a worldwide flood that changed everything, changed all this? The flood is the the uh, event that, that reconciles uh, this. And this uh, slide illustrates you what we're talking about in terms of the geologic layers out there. You have your geologic column on the left. You've got uh, the evolution model in the middle and the uh, creation model on the right. And what is so different is the, the time factor is illustrated. Look at the uh, evolution model. Well, you know, we got the geologic column on the left here. Oh, the last picture, actually, we're talking about layers up there in the top of the greenish section of the Mesozoic. Uh, the pinkish layers we showed you a little higher up were in the bottom of the uh, greenish layer, on the greenish unit of the Cenozoic, uh, so on. That's so you, you have uh, that column there. Uh, how the column fits in terms of interpretation is in the middle, evolution. Uh, they have time from zero to 4,600 million years. And I uh, <coughs> feel that evolution has proceeded through that uh, column there. In contrast to that, uh, in creation, uh, we thought perhaps about an empty earth here before creation week, although not uh, all creations agree with that. <coughs> then you have 10,000 years ago, uh, or less, 6,000 years ago, creation week. I probably some sedimentation before then. Most of the GI column is put in the flood, and then we've had some post-flood sedimentation. So, uh, But the contrast here is uh, billions versus a few thousand. And this is, this is the issue, and this is, of course, what uh, tends to generate a lot, of, a lot of discussion, and that's what we want to get at today. Uh, well, uh, it's not saying just about it plays a crucial role in this question. The flood is the event that can reconcile those geologic layers, those millions of years out there, with a recent creation in the model we showed you. Because you have a recent creation, and you have the flood that deposits these layers. That's why geology is so important in this issue and in this question of uh, if we, is the biblical account of beginnings true? <coughs> well, uh, you can't dismiss that flood uh, very easily from the Bible, although a lot of Christians do. The uh, Bible devotes three chapters to it, uh, leading biblical authorities authenticated. Let me quickly go through just uh, Peter uh, here talks about. Uh, whereby the world then was being flowed with water, perished. 
Kiki very much uh, uh, believed in the flood and uh, talks about the ark. Uh, eight souls were saved in it. He very much believed in the details of this flood. Paul, uh, I realize uh, in Hebrews, especially speaks about the flood. Um, these folks all believed in the creation the account also. They authenticated it at least. Uh, <coughs> talk as though they believed in it. Uh, Hebrews 11, 70, by faith Noah and so on prepared an ark to the saving of his house and so on. Uh, Christ believed in creation and the flood, of course. Uh, he talks, talks about it and knew not at the flood until the flood came and took them all away. And we go on with God himself. There's no higher authority in the Bible than this, folks. Very much authenticates creation in the Ten Commandments. This is all stuff that's beyond those first 11 chapters of Genesis that we uh, told you are said to be uh, not so authentic. On uh, Isaiah 54, 9, God himself talks, I have sworn that the waters and oceans should no longer cover the earth. So on. So uh, the leading biblical authorities authenticate the first 11 chapters of Genesis there's no good reason for rejecting them uh, if you're going to take the rest of the Bible very seriously. <clears throat> well, uh, important to the flood. As I said, it's, it's a great event that reconciles the six-day creation week, the fossil record. Uh, you don't have much time before uh, the flood in terms of activity. Because right now, everything's going on very slowly, folks. We, we only... Uh, you rode 61 millimeters per thousand years on average over the world. Uh, under normal conditions, you don't do very much. And you don't have much time to do it in uh, between creation and the flood. Uh, time or the at least the other part in the Bible. Or, or after, you don't have very much going on either under normal quiet conditions. So it, that flood becomes extremely important there in this, in this uh, issue. And, well, uh, furthermore, if you put a lot of time in the fossil record, there's no way that God created all in six days. Uh, here, here are some layers out there. Uh, if you have these, there are fossils, different kinds of fossils, different levels here. This is Dead Horse Point in Utah. Uh, if you have certain kind of fossils in the lower layers, and uh, it's not in the upper layers. In the upper layers, you have different kinds of fossils, not in the lower layers, and so on. And you say there's millions of years between these two fossil groups. There's no way that God did it all in six days, of course, because you're saying there's many years between. And here's a picture of the uh, distribution of fossils in those layers out there. Uh, Precambrian is... Uh, uh, down at the bottom and so on. You get Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic there. Those are uh, the layers where we have most of the fossils. There are hardly any fossils in the Precambrian, and uh, uh, which is uh, very, very interesting. We can get to that a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, supposing you, you see Demetrodon up there in the top of the Paleozoic, you find him there, you don't find him higher up. Uh, you got uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex near the top of the Mesozoic there to the right, uh, greenish. Uh, if you say there's millions of years between those two, of course, God did not do it all in six days. So uh, this challenges God's integrity in the Bible. So this is what we're looking at here. Uh, and. Uh, a lot of churches and groups have uh, suggested alternative concepts. And I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, with this. I had a chance to do in that chapter, which I did not have time to do earlier. But, uh, some suggest, well, uh, in order to accommodate the, the long geologic ages of the scientific community over the world, let's say the flood was a local event. Uh, problems? Well, uh, it's not what the Bible talks about at all. The Bible says, all the high hills and the whole heavens were covered. All flesh died. 
that moves upon the earth. Another question, why build a huge ark to preserve the right hands of a variety of animals if you're just going to have a local flood? Uh, another one, God promised not to delay, destroy again uh, by this method. We've had a lot of local floods since then. A local flood doesn't seem to be what God had in mind at all, or what the Bible had in mind in terms of what uh, is described there. Others lean towards these. Well, God, sure, he, he, uh, he used the process of evolution. He helped it along. Uh, and, uh, but the gaps between major fossil groups uh, indicate that you know, evolution did not occur. A uh, fairly solid conclusion. Uh, secondly, uh, the very dominion to God, who created life and so on, at least most people think he must have been involved in creating life. And so on. Why, why would he have to use the, the, the crutch of evolution and so on to produce advancement? And then, uh, furthermore, it very much challenges God's goodness, his character. Survival of the fittest is a very mean process, you know. Those that are weaker, they get put out of the way. The strong survive, uh, which is not the God described in the Bible. He tries to save the sinner. Uh, he notes the fall of the sparrow and so on. Uh, a definite conflict between a god such as uh, the god of theistic evolution and the Bible, uh, the, the god described in the Bible. Well, uh, alternative concept, uh, <coughs> progressive creation, something. Well, uh, God didn't have to use evolution. He just created, over long periods of time, uh, for millions of years, left things alone, then comes back later, creates some more, and, and so on. It's called progressive creation. And uh, it produces more advanced organisms as you go up through the, through the geologic column. Well, uh, again, challenges that. This is not what the Bible says at all. God, in the Bible, God created in six days. Furthermore, God's creation is described as very good. And uh, you look in the fossil record, uh, and you see uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, like we illustrated earlier. Uh, this doesn't quite fit with what we'd expect from God. And uh, furthermore, as you go up through those layers, you have the extinction of many groups. Uh, and the Ordovician, and the uh, end of the Ordovician, and the Divonian, and the Permian, uh, end of the Triassic, uh, end of the Cretaceous, end of the Eocene, and so on. Major groups die. Uh, It'd be strange for God to create these groups and then let them die off. It's, this doesn't make much sense in terms of uh, if you're going to have a creator God, for him to do that. Uh, because we do have different organisms at different levels in that fossil record and so on. And uh, another question, really, why would uh, God wait for millions of years between various creation event events? Uh, it seems kind of bizarre. Uh, just a, a picture of what might have happened in the flood. We have various flood models. Uh, we don't have it all worked out at all. Uh, this is just one of them. And uh, A is before the flood, the top one. The middle one is the flood. And you see water covers the whole earth. And then after the flood, we have uplift and erosion and so on that produces the layers as we see at present. Uh, that's not especially our concern in this discussion. Uh, but what about the evidence for the Genesis flood? This is where the rubber reach, meets the road in terms of uh, this question. And uh, we're going to go over uh, several. Of these. these are the eight topics, and there could be a lot more, that I mentioned in the, uh, in the chapter. The first one is, is widespread uh, sedimentary deposits. I've talked to you about this before, but we're going to go into the details of uh, one of these uh, just to uh, uh, discuss it a little further so you understand uh, it's, it's not just uh, general statements that we have involved. But first, I must tell you just a little bit about soft sediment behavior. Now. Uh, Soft sediment uh, uh, acts certain ways when it is soft, uh, and so on. Who want to look at that? 
the uh, <coughs> uh, issue comes uh, to light quite easily when you look at certain things. This is an Arches National Park. And you look at that whitish layer right in the middle, and especially towards the right. You can see where that whitish layer, which is the Entrada sandstone, uh, goes into the reddish layer below it, which is the Carmel Dewey Bridge, depends on which interpretation, nomenclature. Uh, the nomenclature of these layers is, is uh, quite subjective at times. But you, you see where it goes in, uh, into toward the red. And you can see where the red goes up into the, obviously, these two had to be soft when this happened, or you would not have this, this, this intrusion of one uh, into the other. Uh, don't get the idea now that because we have soft layers here, that this proves the flood, please. Uh, geologists who speak of millions of years have no trouble incorporating this into their model. They say, well, these layers were soft when they were laid down. They intruded each other. This is a local thing. And uh, they put millions of years between other events. They preserve the long geologic ages, even though they, they uh, see evidence here that, hey, uh, this is unusual. Uh, however, I'll say, you know, when you see too much of this, you start wondering, uh, as I do. Uh, Here's another example. This is uh, near Green River, uh, Utah, <coughs> Hatch Mesa. Right at the top of the picture, you see kind of a thick layer there. Uh, it's a turbidite. Okay, it's been laid down instantly. This is all standard geological literature interpretation, folks. Been laid down instantly. Uh, <coughs> below it, uh, you see the middle layer, you see the red arrow? At the level of that red arrow, uh, you see a, a layer, it's about three feet thick. And uh, very interesting, what's going on here, where that red arrow is pointing to stuff going up between that ball to the right and kind of a part of a ball to the left here. Uh, things must have been very soft. Hey, what's the interpretation here? First, that middle layer that has the ball on it and so on, all across the picture, that middle layer is considered to be a turbidite. This is again laid down instantly. It was laid down instantly and the interpretation is uh, the layer below it had to be soft and it was so soft that uh, the material from that layer squeezed up in between, and that's the way you produce these balls. And uh, the ball and pillow is kind of a standard uh, geological interpretation for certain features like you have right here. And this, uh, again, uh, is what you'd expect uh, during a flood uh, where things are laid down rapidly. Uh, what happens is that uh, the layer on top may be a little heavier in terms of density than the one below, and you have foundering going on, and material from the lower layer squeezes up because it's lighter. Uh, this is the ball and pillow picture. Uh, here's another ball and pillow. This is near, near Wellington in Utah. Uh, the whole set of rocks that you see in the top half of the picture uh, is part of a layer. It's called the Ferran Sandstone. Uh, that layer, uh, oh, it's at least 70 miles, a layer, at least 70 miles. You know, this is, this is unusual for us uh, nowadays. I mean, we, we have all kinds of these layers. When we talk about the Grand Canyon in a few weeks, uh, we'll talk about these, uh, these layers, it's incredible. But uh, it's 70 miles, and it shows the same ball and pillow uh, feature here. Uh, if you uh, <coughs> look to the right, you've got a ball there. Uh, and if you follow the 
red arrow, it's where soft sediment went up between. Where you have green arrows, you have layers going down. And again, the explanation is here, well, uh, we had this soft layer of shale below. We had the sand laid over it. The sand was heavier, so it kind of foundered into the other layer. Everything is soft, you understand? And this, you have to go rapidly for this stuff. Uh, because the rocks are going to harden up uh, if you start putting these millions of years in there. Uh, and uh, you can see where you have the green arrows here. Uh, it, it doesn't show up very well on the slide, but you can see if you look at the layers carefully. The layers are actually going down there because of the foundering uh, in both those instances there. So we you know, have evidence of this soft uh, activity, just as you'd expect uh, during the flood. Well. Uh, this one uh, is really uh, boggles your mind in a ways. Uh, this is near Hiawatha, Utah. Uh, this is the Panther Sandstone, this is Cretaceous. Uh, la last picture we showed you was uh, uh, Cretaceous. Uh, the one we showed you in Arches Jurassic, if you are familiar with the July column. Uh, but here, here uh, you see the red arrow. just. Above the red arrow, you see that long oval uh, structure. And there's another one next to it. These are balls in the standard interpretation. Uh, again, they think the whole thing had to be soft. There was a shale layer right where the red arrow is. It's not there. It's been squeezed out. It went up, produced the balls. And we, everything had to be soft uh, when, th when this occurred. Well, when you see too many of these, you may wonder, well, maybe there is something to, to this uh, flood story. Uh, an experiment done by Kuhn. Yes. yes. Uh, could you go back to that last slide? Yes. Um, how much time, supposedly, according to standard chronology, was it required for those balls to settle? <coughs> um, this had to happen instantly, okay? And in terms of geologic time, okay? Yeah, yeah. According to that, no, the interpretation of the literature, no. There's no way you get this unless everything is soft. And you have, uh, this, this next slide I'll explain to you just a little bit your, your question. Uh, in Holland, Kuhnen, very famous uh, sedimentologist, he did an experiment. And the top part, A, he took sand, he put it over a layer of mud. Mud's the brown layer, sand's the, the tan layer above. Uh, so he lays the sand above the mud layer. And then he shakes this. This is in the laboratory. He shakes it. Shaking causes the foundering because the sand is heavier. And you can see where it uh, starts falling down and you shake it some more and you have the pillows. This is where they get the ball and pillow terminology. Uh, but it has to happen rapidly. They suggest during earthquakes, you know, and, uh, certainly you'd expect a lot of earthquakes during the, the Genesis flood, but everything is going up and down all over the place. Uh, so it tends to fit quite nicely with that. So no, this is rapid. It has to be rapid. It's the only way it's printed. Uh, they both have to be very soft. If they were dewatered at all over a length of time, the foundering would never occur. Uh, you're not going to get these things to f go down into hard material. No way. They're both soft, incidentally. Uh, but in, especially get that. Now, if you go to uh, uh, Horse Gulch, uh, right outside of Durango, Colorado, uh, you, you'll see this picture here of uh, foundering. And it's typical ball and pillow structure. Uh, you, can see, you can see three balls, at least up there in that layer above, and you've got the pillows below. Uh, <coughs> this is the point lookout sandstone above, Mankoff shale below. Again, it's Cretaceous material. Uh, but uh, the standard interpretation, you know, this, is, this has happened. You, know, you had this earthquake. Stuff foundered, 
and uh, you have these, these pillows below, uh, tiny pillows below, uh, as a result of this kind of activity. Well, uh, let, let's get to one specific layer that's very interesting out there. Uh, I picked one above the Grand Canyon, so I said I'd repeat what we're talking about later on when we're talking about the Grand Canyon, but, uh, and that's the Shinarab conglomerate. That is a layer, uh, it's coarse to pebbles in size, which means, you know, it takes a lot of energy to move this. It's spread over 100,000 square miles in Arizona, uh, Utah, uh, and some of the states uh, close by. And uh, usually considered to be a river deposit. That's a standard interpretation, a river deposit. Uh, it be extremely widespread river to 100,000 square miles. We don't have rivers spreading material over 100,000 square miles nowadays, you understand. Uh, we get rivers maybe uh, a few miles wide at most, uh, but not over 100,000 square miles. Uh, Stokes uh, suggests, well, maybe the, you know, they're desperate for some answers to how you get this. Uh, they talk about it being a pediment. Pediment is the stuff that accumulates at the base of the mountain. It comes off the mountain and accumulates at the base. That's the pediment. Uh, well, these things, you know, are seldom uh, well, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand feet wide and so on. Uh, they're not going to produce a single layer, 100,000 square miles, there's no way. But it tells you a little bit about the search for some explanation uh, for something like this. Well, uh, here's an example of that Chenard conglomerate. It's the layer that's above the green arrow there. Below it is the Mon Kopi. Now, uh, and interestingly, between those two layers, there's supposed to be 10 million years. Uh, Mon Kopi's lower Triassic, if you concerned about your geologic column. Middle Triassic is missing. The upper Triassic is the Chenard conglomerate, which is that layer above it. It's, it's a, a coarse layer. It's going to take a lot of energy to move it, incidentally. It's not always this coarse at all. Uh, largest rocks here are about two inches. Uh, but uh, it tends to be at least a coarse sand, or, or sometimes uh, much coarser like this over 100,000 square miles. Now, interestingly, you look in some places, and that Moen Kopi, which is reddish, intrudes into the Shinarp, which is the yellow, more yellowish layers, uh, uh, including the mass to the left of that uh, green arrow, and that green arrow points to you some more Kofi intruding into this. Well, now, could both of these be soft? They had to be soft when you intrude like this. They had to be soft. Yet you have 10 million years between them. This, this look, seems quite unlikely. Uh, here's another case, uh, the same region. See the brownish layer? That's more Kofi intruding into various layers of the Chenaire. and. That Mon Kopi is supposed to be 10 million years older than the Chenier layers uh, above and below it. And uh, go to Capitol Reef, uh, you know, wonderful place, Capitol Reef National Park. Uh, and you, you uh, look at the red arrow there. The red arrow points to the Chenier conglomerate. I told you this is 100,000 square miles. You know, it's, it's, it's there in Capitol Reef. Uh, and you can follow it all the way across the picture at, at, the, at, the, at the base of that whitish layer there that you have there. That's a Chenera. Well, You go a little further down the main road, Capitol Reef, uh, and you look at the contact where you can get the contact between the Chenera, uh, which is the red material above, and the Moen Kopi, which is green material. And uh, note that uh, we seem to have some pillows here. And in fact, uh, this pillow, if I can get this uh, 
pointed towards it. You see this pillow right here and that little string out there and so on. It looks almost just like, you remember the, that experiment that Kuhnen did in Holland? He had these stringers sticking out at the end. Uh, I have not, uh, actually I'd, I'd like to um, check out uh, in thin sections and so on. You like to uh, make sure these are uh, chenaric. They sure look like it. You know, the red is the chenaric. A green is the monocopy. But you know, it's supposed to be 10 million years between the They both had to be soft. So we have this evidence, you know, hey, something, something uh, is not quite right here. Uh, something fits very nicely what you'd expect during the Genesis flood. And going a little further with that one, uh, here is a, uh, a contact between the Chenarif and the Monkopi. This is right at the st on Highway 89, right at the state line between Utah and, and uh, <coughs> Arizona. And uh, you see those three red arrows. They, they point to dips in the Chenarif. And you look underneath there, and it's ripple marks. Now, the, the big question is, of course, that green arrow points to the contact between the two. Mon Kopi below, Shun Arab above, 10 million years between. Could the ripple marks of the Mon Kopi, which are reflected in the Shun Arab, because the snare was laid on top of it, you know, it had to be soft when it was laid down. Uh, could those river marks survive for 10 million years? It doesn't seem like it. This looks like a uh, rapid deposition. Uh, and a block of snare has tumbled down the hill from, from this place here, and you can see the river marks on the snare. Here, here they are right there. You, you see them going across the top of that block right there. It tumbled down, and it doesn't look like that 10 million years ever took place. It looks like this was instantaneous uh, uh, deposition. Well, uh, layers on Thursday, right spread. I, I thought I would uh, just take a, a minute or two and tell you just a little bit about how some of the literature recognizes, hey, there's something different out there. Uh, I need to go rapidly through this. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, what for uh, I've quoted to you a recent uh, example of that. I want you to know uh, this has been in the literature for quite a while. Uh, principles of uh, uh, geology and so on. Uh, shadow or great areas are and so on. They did so accumulate many times in the past. And you can't, com can't find anything today that compares to it. They have these, these tremendously widespread layers out there. And you don't see them being deposited now uh, on that scale at all, as, as he points out here. Another one, Newell says, uh, Mesozoic limestone seeds spread over immense and incredibly flat areas of the world. Uh, Thornbury says, Little Earth's topography is older than tertiary, and most of it no older than Pleistocene. The implications of this statement are tremendous. Uh, because uh, your tertiary, uh, look in the third column over at tertiary is towards the top, the second from the top. He's saying our topography is all up there. Well, why? Well, because the, uh, below it, you've got all these flat layers laid down rapidly, one on top of another. Uh, fa fairly, uh, you know, a uh, striking statement that the present is not the key to the past when it comes to this. You know, look at the Grand Canyon, you know. This, you follow the horizontal layers all over the place. Uh, Tremendously widespread uh, deposits. Uh, well, evidence for genocide. The second point in the chapter I made is widespread fossil distribution. Um, just a brief point. You find in the scientific literature, they talk, hey, uh, these fossils are much more widespread than we find comparable groups at present. Just one little example here. Uh, well, I uh, want to make one point. Keep in mind, though, this may not be due to the flood. It could be due to climatic factors. Uh, the climate in the past, uh, we don't have good, very good hard data on it. Uh, in general, uh, oxygen isotope data, oxygen 18 and so on, suggests in general the past was quite a bit warmer than at present. 
so there's some difference. So, uh, but either way, the biblical model seems to uh, explain it to a certain extent. Uh, we have a different world now. Uh, there was no rain before the flood and so on. Uh, so uh, it suggests definitely there's been a difference here and so on. But uh, uh, Bart Horn, for instance, talks about the extraordinary cosmopolitan distribution of many ancient groups. And he, this, is, this is a standard uh, picture, you know, and the past was different. And it's whether it was spread by a flood or climatic factors, it still speaks of a very, a very different path than we have now. Uh, the orange spots, they don't show up very orange with this uh, projector here. Uh, you see some in South America, you see some in Australia and that region over there. That's the present distribution of Araucaria. That's the Norfolk Island pine group. You, you may have seen Norfolk Island pine. <laughs> pine trees are central uh, pillar, pillar of all horizontal branches and so on. Uh, in the fossil record, the green shows you uh, where it's found. It's found, you know, most of the world. Uh, so there's that little bit. Uh, in the chapter, I talk about abundant underwater activity like turbidites. I talk about abundant ocean sediments on the continents. You know, you have more material from the ocean on the continents than you have material from land on the continents. That's not what's going on now, but it's what you'd expect during the flood. What's all that material there uh, doing on the continents? Uh, evidence of continental scale currents. Uh, looks like, you know, uh, Paleozoic, for instance, almost all your, your major direction is to the southwest for all the North America. And this seems to uh, uh, hold up quite well in other places also. And then uh, survival of ancient surfaces. I've talked to you about this in the past before. And so flat surfaces, they're there. Erosion, uh, like Kangaroo Island, you know, 160 million years. Surface said to be 160 million years. It's just as flat as could be. Erosion, you know, it's been at least five kilometers of erosion and 160 million. It's still there, uh, challenging the time. So, uh, then you got the flat gaps and sediment layers, paraconformities. I, I just thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about the. I've talked about this many times to you folks before. Uh, but uh, briefly here, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, this is admitted in the literature. Geographic sediment rock is full of unconformities. Those are gaps that represent long periods of emergence of erosion of continent-sized regions. And this is where I totally disagree. Because if it was erosion, they wouldn't be flat. He says these unconformities are commonly nearly planar. How can you have flat erosion when you don't have any examples on the Earth right now? Here's erosion. You see how irregular it is? Uh, other gaps here, we have that 10 million year gap. That's the same one we've talked about before, uh, between the Mon Kopi and the Shunarab, that 10 million year gap where that arrow is there. You got another 20 million year one gap here. 20 million year, you don't have any erosion 20 million years. This data you know, that favors the, uh, the biblical model quite well. And you go 200 miles south from Dead Horse Point, where that last picture was. Uh, this is near uh, Hurricane uh, in uh, Utah, southwestern Utah. And you've got that same 10 meter gap between the Chenera and the Mon Kopi right there. And look how flat it is. 10 million years, and you. you have this 100,000 square miles. Uh, this is this data that fits very wonderfully well with uh, the biblical interpretation. And the question is, you know, if you lay down flat layers in step one, you erode it, like they suggest it should be irregular, they say flat. Uh, sedimentation over that, it's going to be irregular. You should be able to pick it up. We look at it uh, in the last step, it's still flat. Uh, 
And this explains it all again. Uh, layers there. The uh, middle layer right, th this little gap right here, so you can see the arrow. That's the one we've been talking about here uh, between the Mon Kopi and the Shinarip. That is not listed there. But uh, these lines right here tell you the present surface of the Earth. And uh, one's along Interstate 70, which is the flattest you could find. This is a little further south. Look how irregular the surface of the Earth. Look how flat these layers are out there. Tremendously widespread, tremendously flat. Uh, gaps, the parts of the July column missing. The black represents the gaps. These layers actually all sit on top of each other. They're about three and a half kilometers thick. And across, there's 133 kilometers represented on this. So it's a tremendous vertical exaggeration here, uh, just to get it on the slide. But uh, you get the idea that where you have these tremendous gaps, you don't have the erosion, uh, 150 million years here. Uh, and look how flat this is. Uh, you don't look how irregular erosion is. Uh, well, uh, what about people have asked me all kinds of questions about these things? You know, uh, I'm going to quickly go through through uh, uh, some questions that are raised. Up. Could these just represent flat depositional areas of the Earth? Well, no, this is not going to work at all. If you have deposition, you don't have a gap. Uh, this is a non-question. Could these flat areas just be uh, locations where there is no erosion or deposition? We don't know of any such place on the Earth. Over these wide areas, you're going to have to suspend the weather. You're going to, you either have deposition where material is carried down, or you have erosion where material is washed away over the Earth over these millions of years. Uh, can erosion be flat? There was a model for this. Uh, William Davis, professor at Harvard University, a century ago, uh, a little over that, uh, proposed that, hey, we have flat erosion. And he called these peneplains. And this as is still used now as a suggestion. Hey, hey, these are peneplains. Well, you know, about half a century ago, peneplains were thrown out of the uh, geological interpretation thing. It was an idea that caught fire, and uh, it was uh, very popular in France and England and the United States, that, hey, you have uh, peneplain, but you just erode down till everything's flat. And then you raise it up again, you have irregular erosion, then you erode till it's flat and so on, and you had just one peneplain on top of another, everything was a peneplain uh, for these flat gaps. Well, uh, this is what uh, Butcher says, is known as the cycle erosion is forced upon all landscape evolution in humid lands with special adaptations for deserts, glacial highlands, coast decades of semantic bickering followed during which true age was confused with geometry and historical evolution replaced by a prior mechanism, mechanistic sequences. None of the underlying theoretical points was tested empirically in the end, an observational science was used to a parlor game of inductive reasoning that could be mastered by a freshman student. Division, that's name on name for William Davis. Division geomorphology, it was called, died a death of sterility several decades ago, despite the lingering stage in cycle approach in most textbooks. It's an idea that still prevails a little bit, but it is no longer considered valid. Uh, Pity says, although demonstrable unconformities abound, W.M. Davis admitted that it was difficult to point to a clear present day example of peneplain. You find all kinds of these flat things through the layers, as I showed you that uh, slide of black and white layers there a while back. Uh, but you can't find them on the earth at present. Uh, boom. It would be appropriate to desire uh, to describe a modern peneplain, but unfortunately, none are known. Uh, could these gaps have been uh, protected from Europe in the past by overlying layers? Well, if they were, you know, you'd see the remains of the overlying layers unless you had eroded exactly down. Uh, you don't see that. Uh, is there evidence for weathering at the, uh, over time at these gaps? Usually not. Uh, some suggestion occasionally of weathering, uh, but uh, Newell points out here and so on, uh, 
general lack of physical evidence of subaerial exposure. These boundaries are pertinent for that only by the fossil evidence. Uh, it's, it, there is no good explanation for these gaps, uh, except in the context of rapid deposition. Is there evidence for erosion at these gaps? Occasionally you find a little bit. Usually it's you know one one percent to one thousandth the amount you'd expect over the long times they suggest for these gaps. Uh, could erosion have been slower in the past? Probably a little bit, but uh, erosion is so fast, you know, that uh, we could have eroded our continents at least a hundred times. Uh, they're still here. Since the layers thin out to the edges, does this not challenge time arguments? Well, you go into a time track, I think you might be able to uh, suggest something that, that, well, the age is different. Jill uh, poses to posed this question to me once, and uh, I told him, well, look, I don't, I don't care what you do at the edges of these gaps. You've got 100,000 square miles here. You're going to have to explain to me how that's going to sit there for 100,000 square miles for 10 million years, and you're going to have an erosion. And he had no answer for that. Uh, the edge argument doesn't answer the, the argument of the widespread layers, and so on. And since the layers thin out at the edges, does this not challenge the time argument? Uh, I guess we, we went over that then, anyway. Uh, do you say about the underwater? We said, if the gaps, oh, yeah. If the gaps were underwater, would this not protect them from erosion? Not at all. We have a canyon uh, as big as the Grand Canyon, right up here. Uh, near Monterey Bay, underwater. Uh, water erodes, carrying sediments and so on. All erosion is basically underwater anyway. Uh, so being underwater doesn't protect uh, from erosion. It's what does it. Uh, since the layers thin out at the edges, it does not change the time argument. And uh, I, I mentioned that uh, again. Uh, uh, and then since the gaps are local, does this not eliminate their significance? Uh, and that's a non-question. They are not local. Uh, so, uh, does the fossil sequence show evolution in advance? I must tell you, I just want to take about five more minutes, but it's 11.30. We got started late, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, those of you who have to go to uh, other appointments, I'm warning you, but I'm going to go on just to get at this one question here. Uh, the, uh, this is a basic issue, and I'm so glad I had time to put it in this chapter, because uh, this is a question that students face. They, most people don't know about it, but they get into their biology textbooks, and biology textbooks at least the more comprehensive ones often refer to the fossil record and so on. And they see, hey, there's a sequence here. It looks like uh, it's evolution. And doesn't this demonstrate uh, evolution? Well, uh, for one thing, the fossil sequence does not demonstrate evolution uh, because of the gaps between the major groups. Uh, it does show advancement as one ascends through it. Getting back to this picture here. Uh, you can see in the lowest part here, in the, it's just microscopic organism. This is Precambrian. All of a sudden, we get all kinds of organisms, the Cambrian explosion. Uh, but those are marine organisms, simple and so on. Uh, and you, you go up higher, and you've got uh, more advanced organisms like uh, uh, mentioned or listed there in the, the Paleozoic, the middle section, uh, higher up in that other one, you got more advanced organisms and the most advanced organisms at the top. What is the student going to do with that? What is the creationist going to do with that? Because the other one says, well, this is gradual evolution of man clear up at the top. 
and that, that was the issue I addressed in the book, uh, related to, to that question which students face. And uh, where did all the various organisms of the fossil record live before the Genesis flood? Implicit in the flood model is the fact that all those organisms that we have in the fossil record had to be living just before the flood. And they had to have a place to live. And we need to account for that in the model because it's, it's implicit in it. Uh, there are, and so the model is that there, you know, there were different kind of organisms. A lot of them, they're there. I mean, they're different plants, different uh, animals, and so on. The dinosaurs are an example, and so on. And then uh, the, uh, when you look at the upper Paleozoic uh, and Mesozoic, you find there that, that's where you have organisms that are different than that, than that present, especially different. Where were they? Well, the suggestion is that they lived at lower altitudes. This is different than that present. Those organisms don't exist now. You, would not have the, you don't have the competition from them now. And so you'd have a different system of distribution when you take into account biological uh, uh, competition from those organisms. So, and you, you have it here, uh, the, the general distribution as we mentioned and so on. In general, uh, the upper part of the Paleozoic uh, this section right here, this upper part, and this uh, Mesozoic. This is the part that is different than at present in terms of the kinds of organisms, all kinds of plants and animals that we don't exist, don't exist right now. Uh, suggestion is they lived at different levels and, and uh, when the floodwaters came, uh, purple arrow there shows you the lowest marine material Red arrow a little higher up, material from a little higher up be deposited, and so on. All deposited in these depositional basins, so we develop our geologic column uh, by following these arrows one after the other. It's the gradual rising of the waters of the flood that does this. And here's a picture of how animals and plants were distributed before the flood in terms of that interpretation. Blue arrow points to microscopic organisms in the rocks that are there now. You'd expect that. The purple arrow points to a major sea. There you'd have lots of marine material. Red arrow points to the upper Paleozoic. Yeah, you've got trees like you know, Calamites, Lepidodendrons, so on stuff you've never heard about, uh, at least. Uh, they're only in the fossil record. These are different kinds of trees that live there and form our coal, so our eastern coal uh, material we have here in the United States and so on. Uh, a tan arrow points to uh, dinosaur region and so on. They lived at that level. And higher up where it was cooler, uh, you have the uh, mammals and uh, man and so on. If you bury this by gradually rising water, you'll have your fossil sequence. To me, this is the best explanation I have for this. There are other factors, such as flotation of carcasses, which may have had a part. Motility may have had a part in distribution, but uh, this may have been the general picture. And uh, there is good data that supports this to a certain extent. Uh, this is the distribution here. Look at the red line. That red line is the Cambrian explosion. This fits beautifully with the idea of the lowest seas before the flood. Because all of a sudden we get all these marine organisms. What's between the red and the blue line, this is all material from the ocean. This would be the lowest seas before the flood, just where you'd expect them. Above the blue line, then you've got where those dinosaurs and other uh, animals lived at that time and so on. And then clear up at the top, you'd have the mammals. But uh, it fits 
nicely in terms of the fact that if you had this distribution, you have increase in complexity, and you have uh, very sudden appearance of marine material, and you have very sudden appearance of terrestrial material, which is the blue line. Kind of what you'd expect for rising waters of the flood. Uh, so th that is the explanation you have for this thing. Well, uh, I've gone over all the, uh, this. At the end of the book, of uh, the chapter, I, I list, you know, 10 different geological uh, problems for the long geologic ages. And I'm not going to take time to go through this uh, because of the lateness. Uh, and in concluding, let me just make a couple of statements here. It says, there's a lot of data, scientific data that fits better with the biblical model of recent creation than with evolution over billions of years. A special note from a geological perspective are one extremely widespread sedimentary layer, the lack of evidence for geologic time where major parts of the geologic column are missing, and third, rapid rates of erosion. Erosion is way too rapid uh, <coughs> to fit into the long geologic ages, as I've told you. Our continent should have been eroded away at least 100 times. Uh, over a geologic time, they're still here. So uh, one does not have to abandon scientific integrity in order to believe the Bible. A lot of the data from nature is hard to explain unless interpreted in a biblical context. One definitely has a choice here. And I mentioned this explanation, which I, I uh, so meaningful to me in a way that one from Ellen White. She says, while God has given ample evidence of the faith, he will never remove all excuse for unbelief. All who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those who refuse to accept God's word until every objection has been removed and there is no longer an opportunity for doubt will never come to it. So God is not going to force us. You have data on belief. You don't have to give up your scientific integrity. Uh, there's plenty of data there uh, to, to, believe, to believe the Bible. And finally, I would say you can trust the Bible, and a lot of scientific data authenticates it. OK, any questions? Uh, let's get some uh, microphones going here. So we'll have one over here. Uh, Dr. Harry, <clears throat> thank you for uh, the very valuable information you have shared with us. <laughs> I have a question, but before the question, I have a comment about the temperature in this room. I don't know if it is my age. But I'm freezing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if, what? <laughs> if I had known this room would be so cold, I probably wouldn't be here. I've been suffering. While enjoying your presentation, I've been suffering because of the cold. I mean, am I the only one? Or is there anybody else who has been uncomfortable? Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. Well, okay. No, no, no you, you're, you're partly right. I, I just want you to read, know what it says here. Do not touch thermostat problems and so on. And call Anne, and you got a phone number. So, uh, but uh, we've always had this problem in this room, okay? It seems to me that the temperature here, yeah. way below, uh, what I consider comfortable, but yes. maybe for other people. I, uh, but I, here's my I question. I fully understand your statement. Okay. Here's my question. <coughs> I've been, of course, I, I like to, uh, how do you say, participate in, uh, on the internet with people who do not share our views. <coughs> and uh, I was uh, 
writing some comments regarding this uh, topic. And one gentleman, very knowledgeable scientist, he says, you can, the evidence, there's no evidence in Palest Palestine or Egypt for any, no evidence of flood. He says, you can, it's been, how do you say, uh, proved that you can go back 12,000 years and there's no evidence of a flood. Now, you had a date for the flood as 4,401. 4, I wonder what should I tell this gentleman tomorrow when I <laughs> respond to his comment? Tell him he uh, needs to extend his views beyond <coughs> Palestine uh, and look at the rest of the world, and that there's plenty of evidence in the rest of the world. And in terms of his dating, uh, I would say, you know, uh, this is, uh, he's getting into the area where dating is quite shady. Uh, I mean, so you have carbon-14, you got problems with carbon-14 there and so on. Uh, why, why is it that uh, the good solid evidence for man is so recent? I'm speaking of pyramids, I'm speaking of uh, Roman aqueducts, I'm speaking of uh, highways and so on. Uh, why is it uh, that uh, man hasn't filled the earth since uh, his rate of reproduction is so fast? Now, that's all part of that last slide that I skipped, uh, so on. That, that uh, no one has a choice here uh, as to uh, which model you want to adopt. I'd tell him definitely it has a choice if you know the literature. Thank you. <coughs> I'll tell you right here. Oh. Uh, There's evidence that the Sphinx had yeah, yeah. water damage. What? There's evidence that the Sphinx had water oh. damage at one time. Well, I'm sure you can find out. I mean, to say there's no evidence, don't ever say that uh, for anything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, whether you're on one side or the other. Uh, you can always find evidence for any broad concept. What the question is, on which side is the weight of the evidence the greatest? Uh, which one is true? Uh, that's that's uh, a better, better, way, better way of approaching the question. By the way, I suggested that he read your books. <laughs> Thank you. I, I sometimes feel uh, very challenged uh, when, when I <laughs> when I'm dealing with this conundrum of how do you even speak with people who feel very afraid of this idea of creation. And sometimes, even the very religious, faithful people feel that there is something really uh, uh, threatening about the idea of creation. Now, they wish to believe in God, but they don't like the idea of God having created everything. And. Um, and then there is the atheists who don't even believe in God at all, which uh, I can accept. But why would they feel threatened by the idea of creation? It's as if we're dealing with a very uh, basic fear that, that goes very deep <coughs> and that people simply don't know how to <coughs> handle. And every manner of argument is marshaled forward and no sooner do you uh, topple this one, 10 others pop up and then you <coughs> topple each one of them 
And then at the end, uh, I was watching a TV program once where, where there was a discussion like that. And at the end, when all the arguments were toppled, then he says, but you're fighting for theocracy. And the man who was speaking was actually um, um, a very well-known writer. But he turned around and says, that is not at all the objective. In fact, we would be just as much afraid of theocracy as the atheists are. Because when people try to impose an absolute on fellow human beings, persecution invariably follows. And, and what you have is, it seems to me, you have people who are basically scared that if creation was recognized because of the sheer weight of evidence, or for whatever reason, all our joys and freedoms would evaporate. Why? Because of uh, all the religious people would immediately take that as authority to impose their will on everybody. But guess what? <laughs> Trying to stamp out religion puts you in the same position. We here humans on this planet do not have an escape from this conundrum. We have to learn to treat issues of God humbly and to treat one another gently as God said, hey, what you have done unto one of the least of these you have done unto me. Whether you're atheist or religious, if we treat one another badly, we are condemned just as much. And we have been contributors towards enmity to God. And it seems to me that one of the primary tasks that we have ahead of us is how do we present the character of God in such a way that people will find him trustworthy, that, that he will be more of what he really is and not so crooked like the worst among us. I would just make this comment about, uh, I very much appreciate what you said there, and I think that's the most important question. Uh, the fact that we have this attitude should not completely surprise us uh, if we look at history, you know, of course they say the one thing you learn from history is you don't learn from history. Uh, but uh, in antiquity, you know, reason was the big thing. That was the dominant thought. Reason. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, um, matter wasn't as important, although it wasn't totally ignored. And so on. Uh, during the Middle Ages, you know, it was respect for authority, it was rhetoric, grammar. That was the dominant thing of scholasticism then. Now, in the last two, two centuries, or a century and a half especially, we have moved into a materialistic uh, ethos where matter is important and uh, you go beyond that, you know, it, you aren't as sure, and therefore uh, you, you uh, uh, people feel, feel, feel a little insecure there. I take some comfort in uh, Christ's statements that, uh, you know, narrow is the gate and few are they that find it. Uh, I don't think we can expect uh, overwhelming case in favor of this. 
I do find it hard when I look at the science. I do find it hard to say there is not a God. If there is a God, I do find it hard to think he would not communicate with us. I do find it hard to find anything else but the Bible that seems to be that communication. And so logically, I don't feel I'm in a, just accepting the creation as blind faith. Besides, look at all that geology out there. It's hard to explain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just, I just happened to be reading Ellen White about the Sabbath. I, I don't know exactly where it was at, but I'd paraphrase. <coughs> she says that our finite minds cannot even touch the, the physical information that there is out there, nor the spiritual information that's out there, what God has used to put all this stuff together. And, um, and I don't know, it just seems to me like, um, you know, these wars between uh, the physical world versus the spiritual world, with science versus you know theology or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, none of us are really that fluent on them. Mm -hmm. uh, we might be, in a way, we could be stuck on our own. Maybe um, what's the word? Um, you know, uh, ideas of the past that, inter uh, traditions that even need to be changed. You know, coming up with what we're learning about science. And the other way around also, science needs to be changed, you know, for, for what the spiritual says. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the war goes on both sides, you know. The, mm -hmm. the battle goes on both sides there. And... Um, I I said your a broad approach is a certain amount of protection in a broader approach. You're more likely to find truth if you look beyond just one feature or the other. And uh, I think an eclectic, this is, this is, there's some protection in this. Uh, uh, that uh, we're less liable to uh, make mistakes. And if, if you go purely materialistic, you're going to, you're going to end up with atheism. Uh, if you uh, ignore nature, I don't know how you're going to logically uh, uh, think about reality. Uh, and uh, if you ignore the spiritual, I don't know how you're going to uh, answer that aspect of our, of our beings. Uh, per se, uh, no, take them all in, take them all in. This is a much better approach. Yeah, I think that, that you can't really take one or the other and say that this is one's more solid as far as our understanding goes because mm -hmm. we're studying the Bible constantly and things are changing and so with our understanding of theology as time goes mm -hmm. by also. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I would... I would uh, See, so there is, we need to recognize how little we know compared to, this to, to be able to know. Uh, this, uh, we need to put that in the equation. We need to put that in the equation. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I, but I'm so grateful that, you know, that, that there's enough data out there for us to, uh, uh, believe the Bible is correct. I, I, uh, Ellen White talks about that, you know, she says, uh, uh, but uh, those who want to find the truth will find sufficient evidence on which to base their faith. We're not going to be overwhelmed. Yeah. What I find intriguing is, for example, today we have people who uh, who find it difficult to believe that there is a God because they feel oh, there's no evidence. Uh, but I'm thinking, what about before the flood? There was still the Garden of Eden there with an angel with a flaming sword in front of it. Mm. So why is it that the wickedness became so pervasive then? 
Was it because of a shortage of evidence? Well, if evidence is what determines faithfulness, well, what evidence was missing then? Uh, and, and when Cain decided to kill his brother, was it because of shortage of evidence even after God himself chose to intervene personally? It, 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 it is as if we as human beings, we have a way of convincing ourselves into a position that we desire. No question about that. <laughs> and it matters little whether that position is right, wrong, or sideways. That's a two-edged sword. It is. So we have to first come face to face with the recognition that we have that capacity. Mm -hmm. And then recognize the responsibility that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Because if we do not recognize that, mm -hmm. we can fool ourselves and not even realize. Mm -hmm. And think that we're, you know, ever so smart. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we, uh, you need a balance between agnosticism and uh, operating on the best evidence. And I, I think what I like, I'm more comfortable with operating on the best evidence, not resorting to agnosticism. You, you can, I mean, uh, that, that's another continuum that you, you have to uh, wrestle with uh, in this thing. But uh, I tell you folks, I, I go out there and look at these layers out there, and, right. and uh, two days later I'm still driving and I'm seeing the same layer. <laughs> I tell you, I, uh, I have little trouble thinking, hey, this, this past was so different and it's just, I say just like, it's certainly very much like what I expect during, during a flood type thing. Uh, to me, the, that those widespread layers are a fairly, fairly telling argument that, hey, the Bible is correct. Yeah. Well, I've uh, wondered about that problem for a long time, about people being convinced. And um, I've done a, num a lot of research in the last 10 years on genetics. And uh, one thing that's coming out is that there's actually uh, brain circuitry um, <coughs> Your brain is a mosaic. There's uh, different uh, neurons right next to each other really have a different genetic profile. And I won't go into the reasons why, but I've been working on this and I'm about ready to write it. That I'm proposing that there was the original circuitry put down and then there was a hijacked circuitry that came in and, and will take you off of the, what the original circuitry was because there's when Christ says you're either for me or against me, um, there's only two sets of circuitry in your brain that you can flip-flop between on any given area, and there's millions of circuits. Bottom line is that um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that the wicked prince of this world has influenced the minds of these people. They can't see it. He refers to again in um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 where he said spiritual things are spiritually discerned. He's talking not about the way I see ministers use it all the time as a club to beat anyone over the head that doesn't believe them because if you were spiritually discerning you would see that my theory is correct. It has to do with believing and unbelieving it, it, and, and that is such a misuse of that uh, text is, um, well it's criminal. But it has to do with believing and not be non-believing. You have two sets of circuitry, that's why there's no uh, gray zone where you can have <coughs> An amalgamation, well, I partially believe in God, but then I also believe in this. That gray zone uh, is pretty much absent. You can characterize someone as either being on one side or the other. There's no real gray zone there because you, on close examination, there isn't. There's only two options. We only have two sets of circuitry that you can flip between. And I believe it's the Holy Spirit to a, someone who comes and says, I really want to know the truth. This Holy Spirit illuminates you, hence the comment, many are called, few are chosen, 
or the other one is the straight is the way few find it mm -hmm. and you have to fall on the rock in other words you have to say I really want to know what is the truth I'm um, your default is the other side circuitry that's how you're born that's what you start out using and um, therefore it has not so much to do with convincing someone putting data in front of them that you think is absolutely irrefutable they will come back at you with a um, a position called a uh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word right now but it's a position that's theoretically possible but unprovable uh, rescue position they'll that's come right. back with a rescue, rescue position that's right and and you you, you can never prove them wrong, like panspermia, well, yes. life occurred on Mars. Well, you see, that's irrefutable. And that's that right. allows them to stay in their position. Yes. Uh, and, and even though the likelihood of that occurring is infinitesimally small. Uh, and, and therefore, you will never, ever win the argument because it has to do with which set of circuitry their brain is using. And until they will choose to be open, and whenever way that occurs, and let the Holy Spirit work and switch the gating in the brain, you'll never win. And I, I watch the people going back and forth with these uh, information wars, and in reality, those are a war that will never, ever subside until the panoramic view where God shows what really did happen from A to Z, and it's irrefutable. Until that point in time, it's ambiguous, and it's ambiguous on, a pur on purpose because God wants you to make your decision not on some irrefutable facts, but on whether you like the way he runs his government or not. He doesn't want you to be so confused with, you know, I'm forced to believe in him, okay? Well, I have nowhere to go, well. and then you come walking. You're a rebel that's just waiting to rebel later on in, it, in eternity. You're, and, and therefore, God leaves it ambiguous on purpose, by design, so that the decisions that we come to are not based on geological columns. Mm -hmm. They're based on the way he's going to run his government for eternity. Do you want to live in a, in a, in a, in a government like that? And what you hear from most of these guys who do not want to have this be true was no, they don't. Like Robert Shapiro, Paul Geem said, he wrote, you know, even if all of this is disproved, I, amongst others, will look around through the wreckage. He's talking about evolution and, and, and life being able to spontaneously have occurred. We will look for our best possible answer and we'll set our claim on that and we'll go to prove that. Well, right there you can see it's different circuitry. He's using different circuitry than I am in my brain. There is no reality between us. We are seeing things through completely different glasses, and we will never agree. And um, so the, the Bible is right. The message that has to go out is this is the way the kingdom, this is reality, this is the way reality is going to be for eternity. Do you like what you see? And if you do, come on board. If you don't, the choice is yours. And, and that really draws us right to the um, very crisis, or uh, I should say the tragedy of the Judgment Day. It is, you know, when I was young, I used to think that the tragedy of the Judgment Day was God finally pointing his finger at somebody and saying, aha, now I've got you where I want you. That's not it at all. The tragedy of the Judgment Day is when we all come in a collision with the obvious and we have no way out. That's the tragedy. That's the experience of Judas where he finally finds himself with nothing to stand on, nothing to even think with. He finds himself in a state where he can't logically have the basis for anything rational, for anything <laughs> logical that he can build on. 
And, and that is what God is trying to save us from. And that is why he gives us the opportunities to make a choice. But if all the evidence is unequivocally presented so that there is no escape, you no longer have a choice. <coughs> the choice is made for you. And then what? And, and, and the story in the great controversy at that point, the scene changes. And not one of the people <laughs> who saw that they were wrong changes their mind. This is, the, this is the strange thing about the lost as opposed to the saved. The saved are amazed that they somehow managed to escape this by grace of God alone. And the lost are amazed that they turned out wrong and who's going to pay for it? And then they turn against Satan. But it doesn't, it doesn't change anybody's attitude. It doesn't change anybody's... Uh, and, and something, there was a sentence that Sister White writes there. Even though they realized they were wrong, but their enmity to God has not changed. Oh, yes, they bowed and I, they acknowledged that God is right and good and everything. But that did not change their attitude to him. Okay. Well, it appears to be a contradiction. But that is something that deals with the, 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 the real core of what sin is all about. When Satan first rebelled, he was in the midst of God's presence. How, how was that even possible? Okay, let, let me just throw in this complication here. Uh, one of the questions that is posed at times about the judgment and so on is, are you willing to live with God forever? You may admit he's right, but I had somebody I was discussing things with, and he says, Okay, this was very nice what you explained, but why don't you let me be right now? Yeah. Uh, tr truth. The contradiction is that no amount of evidence can help somebody who wants to be right by definition. And then why do they now? Oh, they bow because. He is right. Okay, we have two more comments. You and yes. him. <laughs> okay, uh, my idea regarding those who bow before God and say, admit that he was right, and then what do they do? Yeah. Final battle, they are ready to fight against God, against all the odds. And here's the, I think, the explanation why the people before the flood could be so evil in spite of the evidence of the angels standing there. Well, think about the devil and his angels. Nobody else had so much evidence for God. The question is not a decision whether there is a God or not. That's important, but not the most important question. The most important question is, do you love the God? that you see? Are you willing to trust him that he is looking after your best interests? <laughs> That's the main question. The devil believes that there is a God and trembles, but he still fights against God. Yeah, well, selective memory sometimes helps us. The, uh, the incongruity here, the apparent incongruity can be explained through the circuitry model I gave you earlier and I can't go through the whole thing there's dozens of articles and the bottom line is if uh, the the wicked remain in the default circuit mode of interconnections with and with which is the way they perceive and think about reality that is reality to them you need God's help with the Holy Spirit to get back to what the original circuitry was and by the way 
you have microglia in the brain that eat up circuits that aren't used. Okay, this has been clearly demonstrated in the last six months, two papers in, in Nature. So if you're not using circuits, certain circuits in your brain, your, your brain wisely destroys them because that um, c computing power, if you will, can be used to better use in something you are using. That's why you, for instance, will use it or lose it is the common statement, and there's a good reason for that. When you lose, and I'm just going to throw this out as a definition, and we can argue about the definition later, but just for argument's sake, the uh, committing the unpardonable sin is when the circuitry which was originally placed in humanity with God from his source is gone. Mm -hmm. There is no further ability for your brain to commute compute in that way of seeing reality and in, in that way of dealing with your surroundings. What happens to these people at the end are they're irretrievably lost because even given the evidence of God, the, Holy, the New Jerusalem comes down, they're still willing to take him on. They're still not, um, the, what brings them to their knees is when they're shown, uh, and I believe this has a special act on God's part, to break through, to show them one last time a unbiased, non-deformed <coughs> picture of real reality because I would argue that the circuitry that mm -hmm. our default circuitry deforms reality and that's part of the problem. It does not allow us to perceive, it, it, the, it is a erroneous uh, picture of what's around us. We're not, we're not able to, to um, cogitate correctly. God has to break in and show them. <coughs> there has a, there's a moment of lucidity where they are actu actually, all of the, the, this erroneous uh, mental baggage that they have been using is wiped clean and they're able to see the truth. They see mm -hmm. the truth for that purpose in that time only, but as soon as they have seen the truth, they still don't like it. God's not going to force them to use the <coughs> circuitry they have abandoned. They don't have it anymore. They have only one way of thinking. Once he has shown them the truth, it disappears, the, the panorama disappears, and they only have one way of computing and thinking, and they're back to exactly where they were before it started. The only difference now is they understand, they have some understanding of why they are where they are. But that doesn't make them sorry for it, that doesn't mean they would change their choice had they to do it over again, because their way, their circuitry setup is, is such that that's the way they're, they are. You can't change the current. Ellen White uses the current of thought in trying to, I think, allude to things of this nature. Their current of thought goes back, she says, after they see the panorama to the way it was before they saw it. Well, I'm so grateful that we have a very intelligent God and that he's a God of love, and that he's going to be able to uh, do that which is best for us. So. You folks have a good Sabbath.